Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Sandy Writes. It is the end of March or the start of April now, so it's time to wrap up my reading for the past month. So in March I read, I believe, seven books. Three of them were rereads via audiobook and four were entirely new reads. One of the new reads was a physical book, which is not off the like, select TBR list I set myself this year, but I retained it recently so I thought, you know, let's actually read it. One was an advanced reader copy, one was a beta read, and... Then we are left with one library book. I think let's go into a few more like genre statistics before we start talking about the individual books. As expected, six out of the seven books I read this month were fantasy, five were young adult, which again, you might better have my shows behind me. I am right now predominantly a YA reader. It's just what scratches my brain right, but also YA should not be counted as a genre, it's an age category. Five of the books this month were horror, two were LGBT, one was literary and one was historical. So I think the literary and historical came from my Aggie the Roo reread. In terms of moods this month, I have a few less than I usually do. I've had like a very strong theme for what I've read in March. So we have Mysterious and Dark as my biggest categories, followed by Tense, Adventurous and Emotional. So I also had one pre-order arrive, which was Where the Dark Stands Still. I purchased All That Consumes Us in Brittle Waterstones because I saw it. It was only $14.99 for a hardback and I thought, you know, I can't leave that behind. And it's on my TBR anyway. And then my one library borrow was The Hollow Places. So let's talk a bit more about the books. The first book I finished reading this month was Small Favours by Erin A. Cray via audiobook, and this is a book that I gave five stars because I love this book so much. Erin A. Craig has become like an autobi author for me. I first read um, House of Salt and Sorrow. I loved it because it's such a me book. Like, did the ending make no sense? Exactly. That's part of the appeal to me. And then I moved into Small Favours, and I adored that as well. I've not actually... I've not read The House of Roots and Ruin yet, I own it, I'm going to read it sometime this year, and then she's got The Thirteenth Child coming out also this year. But Small Favours is kind of like a Rumpelstiltskin retelling, where it's set in a very small community, which again is a great place to have like a horror influence. It's set in a small community where a group of outsiders come in and slowly starts telling all the villagers against each other, and yeah, very loose Rumpelstiltskin retelling, and I've talked about it in the video not out yet. In an upcoming video I talk about all my favourite books and this is on it and I can talk about it in a lot more detail there and a lot more eloquently with my script. The next book I finished reading was The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher because I read Nettle and Bone at the start of the year and I fell absolutely in love with it and her writing style and I thought I need to read everything I can get my hands on and this is the only book that my library book, my library book, my library app has. I gave this book four stars. I kind of describe it as if the 2018 film Annihilation and the Kate Alice Marshall book Rules of Vanishing had a child that was pretty funny but did give me nightmares. This, I don't even know where to begin. This one is kind of a portal fantasy in a sense. It's adult, it's adult, yeah, it's adult. The characters are in their 30s. We have Kara who's going through a divorce, then like her kind of gay best friend Simon who owns or works in the coffee shop next door. And she works in like a lives and works in a museum that's mostly for the taxidermy. And they find a little hole in the wall, and they go through the hole in the wall, and it leads out into this world just full of doors into other other worlds. And that's a terrible explanation, but I can't still wrap my head around what actually happened in this book. But I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> did I love it as much as Nettle and Bone? No, but this one, this one did give me nightmares. And again, it was funny, so I could forgive it. This month I also finished my Adi LaRue reread, just because I have the audiobook for it, and I thought, you know, I like that. And Adi LaRue, I want to say it's a, a controversial VE Schwab book, but it's not, that's what Gallant is. But I think a lot of people give it like five stars or three stars. I think I'm in like the 3.54 star territory, because I love it thematically, and pretty much what's on page. I just think it takes, so, it's so long. And I know that's the point, and that it takes until the end of the book for us to find out that her recounting every single thing that's ever, ever, happened, ever happened to her is the point. But I'm here for Henry Strauss, my beloved. I think this audiobook is the first time that I've like, you know, hit like the, whatever the marker is that kind of annotates um, audiobooks. And it was all for Henry Strauss quotes. He, he gets me, my boy gets me. My one physical read of the month was this one up here. The Bad Ones by Melissa Albert. I got this one in Waterstones on the buy one get one half price offer, and I thought, you know, I have an okay relationship with this author. I read The Hazel Wood as an advanced copy. It was like in the first like two or three advanced copies I ever got, and it was fine. I'm gonna reread it soon because it's such a me book, and the fact that I didn't like it when I first read it is just 
unacceptable. So we're gonna give it another go. But this one I picked it up because it has its weeping angel statue. And I thought, wow, angel mythology. And then it says on the top, goddess, goddess, count of five in the morning, who's alive. So I thought, wow, goddesses, mythology. And it is not about mythology. This is a graveyard statue. I, again, this is a book where I can't fully grasp what happened at the ending. It's about four people who vanish in a single night in the same town. And the best friend or one of those people trying to work out what's happened to them. And the clues point to some kind of tragedy that happened in a school 30 plus years earlier. And this kids jump rope, you know, skipping nursery rhyme that ties all of them together. The end of the description says there's dark forces at work in her town and they'll stop at nothing to keep their secrets buried deep. I don't believe that occurred in the book. I gave this one four stars, probably like a 3.5 kind of way, because I did really enjoy the writing and a lot of things that happened in it, and a lot of things that happened in it also feel relevant to a book I'm writing right now, so of course I have to love it. It's inspiring at some point. I just don't hugely love it for what it was selling to me. And my advanced copy this month was Don't Let the Forest In by C.D. Drews, and I keep wanting to call it Skeleton Boys, because I believe that was the original title of it at one point when it was first on Goodreads. And C.G. Drews is an author I completely adore, and I'm glad that we have some kind of like small friendship, or we did have a friendship fostering, it's someone I've actually, an author I've actually spoken to, and I completely adore her and her books. And Don't Let's Forest In is her first horror. I say, I don't know why I said it like that, it's definitely got horror influences in it. But this book is set in the boarding school, it's about two best friends who have like a queer, codependent, vaguely platonic, not really relationship going on. And one of them draws monsters that come to life and they spend each night in, out in the woods fighting to kill them. In extreme summary again. And again, another book where I got to the ending and I still can't fully grasp what's going on. So I'm going to reread this one. I think it comes out in October, but my pre-order arrives in the UK in December. So I'm going to reread it later in the year, and I'm going to release also my official review at some point before that date, so I have time to think about what actually happened. But this book is kind of like if The Wicker King by Kay Ankaran, which is up here somewhere, and then These Violent Delights but the Mika Nemareva version, not the Chloe Gong version, had a kid that was a touch more tragic. And this book ultimately is like a love letter to grief, and accepting asexual identities and warmth and brutality, which is something that I've come to love a lot about C.T. Drew's works in general. And also it pays tribute to um, former weird kids who like lived in daydreams. And going back to the asexuality point, I believe this book is also already receiving criticism for how it portrays asexuality. And there's just something about asexuality that makes people criticise their representation a lot more than any other sexuality, in my opinion. Just because, you know, this is my identity, so I notice it a lot more. And it's always people saying, like, oh, this doesn't reflect my asexual experience, and that's the whole point. It's, it's a unique experience to you. And the, similar to, like, when Loveless came out. Loveless and Don't Let the Forest In very much represent an experience that's very reminiscent of mine which is why I identified it so much. And I can understand that people are mad that it doesn't reflect their experience, but that's just not how it works. <laughs> you can't make a book with asexual characters that represents every single ace person's experience. And that's my thoughts on that. Then this month I also read Queen of Nothing or reread Queen of Nothing via audiobook. These are up here somewhere. So I'm getting ready to read the Oak duology. Is it, it's called like the Stolen, is it called the Stolen Throne? It's called The Stolen Heir. The Prisoner's Throne is the next book. So I'm getting ready to review those, so I've reread the trilogy just to like refresh my memory. And Queen of Nothing, it's a banger book. Do I remember what happened? No. But also what I love the most about this third trilogy up here, first of all you can get it in the works, like a tenor for all three books, it's very good. But they're also short, but still so incredibly detailed and wonderfully written and complex, and they have so much story in such a short amount of time, which is what I love in books. And then the final book, I'm checking my my reading planner, just because like last month I forgot a book. Also in terms of the reading planner, I pretty much abandoned every page in it except this like calendar view. So I know that when I inevitably make my own reading planner, I know what we're going to leave out. But the last book I finished reading this month was, let's get the abbreviation right, Church of the Mountain of Flesh by Kyle Wakefield, who is one of my beloved friends from the Mavellas days. And this was a beta read. It's a book that I have been like following when he started posting about it on social media and I thought, you know, I am gonna read that someday. And if I can read it early, I will. But in summary, I would review this book as, do not read this book, there was something deeply wrong with the author, I wouldn't recommend it to even my worst enemies, five out of five stars. I didn't actually give this book a, 
a star rating so I decided that when it comes to my friends or people I perceive as my friends even if it's one-sided I'd rather just leave like a positive review or positive sentence without a star rating because I think if it's all positive and like if you give them anything less than five stars it's going to be like a weird relationship I think but this book would be very deserving of five out of five stars this book where do I begin with this book so cosmic horror tentacles it's about a trans sculptor who makes a deal with his like eldritch god former lover to rebuild a church in exchange for his transition in very extreme summary because this book is a 500 page long surreal fever dream that is unapologetically queer and unhinged and the writing is so deliciously descriptive that i did throw up in my mouth at one point but it's all good that's just a sign of good writing it just has this bad impact on me and I was drawn to this book in the first place because it fits my definition of an evil little book, which has been like a slight theme this month. So like body horror, sentient nightmare, protagonists, a chance of tentacles. And this book, as much as it is an evil little book, still has these moments of tenderness and light amongst the dark with these like... Ugh, I think of a very sweet moment. My favourite sweet moment is the well the evil sculptor and the eldritch horror god person like going out into the sea to hold each other in the water so they can finally be like calm enough to sleep and there's also a best friend who will hypothetically hypothetically hide a body for you no questions asked and again a overwhelming horror of a book with these light moments that make it bearable and I said this book is unapologetically queer, specifically trans, and I know we're in a sensitive time for authentic representation of transgender characters, and characters having to act in ways that are deemed acceptable to be likeable by a wider audience. And I will admit, I did go through a lot of this book being like, wow, I wish our evil trans main character made some good decisions and was likeable. And then I remembered, you know, that this criticism going on right now, and I thought, you know what, let gay people be evil. We need gay evil representation. And Kyle Wakefield does present this protagonist as irredeemably evil, and he is a hellbent prophet rather than a saviour of this church. And I now crave that this defined representation is accepted by everyone. I think that's all I have to say today. I think pretty much every book this month was like four stars or in like the 3.5 to 5 star region, so I think my overall rating was four stars for the month, which is a very good month. Going into April, as it is indie April in my mind, I would like to try and read indie books every single day and also catch up on my the books I am judging for the Indie Ink Awards. That's the plan. That's the plan. We're gonna do it. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you check out some of these books, especially Don't Let the Forest In and Touch the Mount of the Flesh when it comes out maybe this year. I believe it's this year. And I hope you love them as much as I do. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye.